The following program is brought to you by Fanbags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with Fan Bags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with the Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Boilers in the Stands. I am your host, Greg Braggs Jr. Alongside me is Joe Jackson. Craig Bowers is on his connecting flight to Phoenix, Arizona. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. This is another Final Four preview week show. We already had one where Dakota Mathias came on. Got one here tonight where the very intelligent, the master of the X's and O's breakdown. Joe Jackson will tell us what we need to know about this game. If you haven't already watched his preview on feed the post, you're doing yourself a disservice. So make sure you check that whole video breakdown down, uh, breakdown out. It's a 15 minute interview of all the keys to the game that here Joe Jackson highlighted. So here it is. And we are going to have, uh, I know I promised some people earlier this week, a Robbie Hummel episode that should be happening tomorrow morning with Craig Bowers uh, hosting the show. So Joe will be on a flight. I will be at Wrigley Field. So Craig should be on with Bobby Buckets Riddell and Robbie Hummel tomorrow morning. So make sure you stay tuned for that. So, all right, now that I got all the pleasantries out of the way, welcome back, Joe. We're excited to talk some NC State versus Purdue Boilermakers here coming up on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening for those of you on the East Coast, Saturday afternoon for those of you that are lucky enough to be in Glendale, Arizona. Yeah, that's an underrated part of it, too, as I kind of realized. I was like, oh, yeah, this game doesn't start at like 9 p.m. It starts at like 3. And and I guess that's an exaggeration. But even the, the championship, right, if Purdue... Um, well, regardless of if Purdue makes it or not, like the championship starts at like 920 Eastern time, but that's 620 Pacific time. So I'm pumped. I'm I'm just so excited. I can't wait to uh, to head out tomorrow, be in Phoenix. Um, we'll have our meetup before the final four game, go to the final four game, hopefully see a championship game with Purdue in it, too, and hopefully see Purdue uh, lift up a trophy. Yeah, it's exciting. We got some people in the chat all talking about when they're taking off. Somebody on Facebook flying out at 1030 here tonight. Tom White doesn't leave till tomorrow. Joe doesn't leave till tomorrow. Craig's going to be there tonight. I'll be there bright and early Saturday morning. Uh, For those of you that don't know, we've been promoting it on socials. We did talk about it on our last show. We will be having a pregame party at Carousel. Uh, It's a Carousel Arcade Bar, which is a four-minute walk from the stadium. We did have a QR code initially no real reason to put that up anymore because the QR code tickets are sold out completely. Not even a day and a half of promoting this show or this pregame party. And it, the QR code tickets are already sold out, but 
There, there will be tickets sold at the door, cover charge of 15 bucks to get in. It's going to be a packed house. Might even see some former Boilermakers that I've been talking to show up. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but apologies to those of you that uh, couldn't get the tickets on time. But really exciting time. We've had a crazy turnout of fans uh, that want to come to that party here. So, again, if you come to Carousel, um, you know, it's, like I said, right down the street from the stadium. You can get a ticket at the door, but you're going to want to be there bright and early. Doors open at 9 a.m. I'll give you some more of the logistics and um, the address to that place here in a little bit. But, uh, Joe, so this the, the floor is yours here tonight. You know, I'm going to listen to you. I know some people are like, let's stop talking, Greg. I, I'm sure there's already somebody saying that right now. This is going to be a Joe Jackson preview show where then I'm going to listen to what you have to say as far as what we can expect of this game. And then I'm going to do my best to come up with intelligent questions. So I'm going to try to enter the mind of one Craig Bowers here. And, uh, but tonight the floor is yours. So however you want to start this, if you want to do keys to the game, if you want to start offense and then go to defense, let me know how you want to handle this. Yeah, I think we can kind of just jump around through various topics and we can start with who, what's going to be the main the main draw to this game, right? And that is Edie versus Burns. And so uh, for anybody that, that doesn't know, I assume everybody watching probably understands who uh, DJ Burns is for NC State. Kind of like a Travion type build of six foot nine, passes the ball really well, bigger body, but moves super well, has really good footwork. And he's just kind of been the, the fun story of this tournament. NC State's the Cinderella type. Uh, Burns is kind of the leader of that. He is um, just not even talking about basketball at this point. He's a fun guy. Like, he is just always going to have a smile on his face. Um, he's just a, a guy to root for. But then when we do look at what this is, right, this this matchup, there's it, – it's kind of – it's two different questions on both sides of how exactly are they going to defend. So we can start with when NC State has the ball, right, and Burns is going to post up and – like Purdue, NC State is going to go to the post up a lot. That is something they will go to, something they will run through Burns. Now, Burns only plays closer to like 25 minutes. Um, and something that I'm just going to keep repeating that like, hey, Edie playing 40 minutes against Tennessee or 39 and a half, like that's insane. Um, but when Burns is in, they will feed him in the post. First thing with with Burns is he wants to get over his right shoulder. He wants so like how Edie wants to get over his left shoulder to his right hook. Um, Burns wants to get to his left hook over his right shoulder. And so what he tries to do and he's really good at is he'll start his post up at even like the three point line. And then he just similar to like Damask, right, for Illinois, where he's kind of that quote unquote like booty ball type. Um, he'll just kind of back you down. He's going to keep working until he gets to his spot. And then what he's really, really good at is once he gets you on the block, maybe six feet out, is he's just going to pin you on his hip and spin. And he is like he's six nine two seventy five. But man, does he move well? right? So the question is for Purdue. Purdue's natural defense has been um, where whoever is guarding the post up forces the uh, guy with the ball to the baseline and the other big is rotated there to help. The only problem with that with Burns is he's such a good passer. And honestly, when he passes, it might be better offense for NC State. And so that's question number one is what does Purdue do? Do they leave Edie one-on-one -on -one and basically say, hey, Burns, you're just going to have to shoot over Edie, and if you make him, we'll adjust from there? Or do they go with, hey, this is what we've done. This is what it's got us here. We're going to do our double team in the post, um, just like we have all season because we're good at it. We know what to do, and you live from there. And so that's kind of question one. But then on the flip side, when you when you flip it around is, hey, NC State has to guard uh, this guy named Zach Edie. And for anybody that doesn't know, he just put 40 points up in the Elite Eight, 16 rebounds to go along with it. Right. And so – NC State, they have not doubled the post all year. That is just not something they've done. They have stayed one-on-one -on -one pretty much the entire season. Maybe they'll have a guard kind of swipe in a little bit, but for the most part, they stay one-on-one. -on -one. And this is what we ran into with Gonzaga, right? They didn't double the post all year. So what did we see in Gonzaga, a team that didn't double the post all year? When you went back and watched Gonzaga versus Purdue, how much more did they do You know, based off of what they did during the season? Oh, man. That was a while ago at this point. Uh, <laughs> I'm just trying to jog the memory. I think from what I remember, it, will, it still was a lot of single coverage for Edie. Um, and then you just kind of, they, they, I think they made the decision of we're just going to let Edie do his thing. And then from there, um, you kind of have to guard on the perimeter. Now Purdue also shot the ball well from three. So Because we saw in the Tennessee game, like at the start of the game, if you watch the broadcast, they said that their plan was to not double. 
yeah. Zach. But then they had to give in more than a few times. Yep. So like, but then at the end of the game, so they did give in a few times in double, and they weren't coming in scraping hard enough. Was one of the complaints uh, by Tennessee's head coach. What's his name again? Um, Rick, Rick Barnes. Barnes. Yeah, at one point during one of the timeouts, he was saying that they weren't coming in and scraping hard enough. But then at the end of the game against Tennessee, they just were leaving him completely one-on-one, which almost tipped the scales back because Edie was so fatigued at the end that he wasn't making all his one-on-ones, but he obviously did just enough to put them over the top. Yeah, and it's just like, the biggest thing when you guard Edie is the team, the entire team has to stick to their principles it is if you're going to double, you have to double hard and you have to rotate. If you're going to stay single coverage and dig, the guards have to dig. Um, if you just leave Edie one-on-one, he's going to get good shots and you're just kind of up to the mercy of whether the ball goes in or not. Um, the other tough thing though, that I was just like, and that you saw with Gonzaga is, is when they do double, like if you don't double the entire season, it is extremely hard to just put that in with and then let alone just put it in for the first time in a, any sort of game but then it's against zach ed right zach ed i mean zach ed's seen triple teams at this point he's seen triple teams on ball he's seen triple teams off ball um you do, don't have a coverage that ed hasn't seen but ed is a guy that nancy state has never ever seen in his in their lives and, and so it's they have to stick to what they want right is is um, speaking from NC State perspective, and it's if they're going to say single coverage, okay, then that means you either are digging down hard or you're literally just saying ED score 50 and we're just going to bet nobody else will score and we'll be able to get you that way. If they double, which I, I lean that way, I lean that they will try to double just with because Burns, as good as he is offensively, isn't great defensively. Um, and if they put DR on him, I don't think they put DR on him, who's their kind of four man, just because he's so valuable defensively. And we'll talk about that later. Um, I assume that they try to double and then it's your rotations have to be good. Also Purdue has to knock down threes, which didn't happen against Tennessee, but right. I mean, that was Purdue's worst three point shooting game of the season and they won in the biggest game of the year. So, yep. I mean, it just goes to show you, like we've said a million times on the show, very hard to beat this team. You need so many things to go right. Um, and Tennessee didn't have quite enough there. Uh, we did have a question from the chat, uh, from Todd Schaefer saying, do you think Zach's experience in practice with Travion? will help against DJ Burns. I mean, yeah, for sure. When I um when I just talked about NC State has never seen anybody like Edie, Edie's at least seen somebody similar to DJ Burns. Are they the exact same player? Probably not, um, but they have a ton of similarities. And so just having that that rep, that experience that you can rely back on is huge, right? It's yep. Would you rather, you know, go into something like this having done it 10 times before or no times? And even if the 10 times were a couple years ago, um, and obviously it's a lot more than 10 times for Edie, but that's just that is good. I we'll see how much it translates or not. There's also the th- thought of like TKR starts on Burns. I don't I don't think that happens, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities. Um, and then they just double. So, but yeah, I I, I agree. I, I think Ed having that experience will it definitely won't hurt. Would probably help a little bit. Yeah. So the other thing that I found interesting in your preview, and I, we are jumping around, so you called this. The other thing that I found interesting in your preview in terms of how they're going to da- guard DJ Burns was, okay, are you going to let him go one-on-one? That's that's the first question. Or are you going to double the post like they always do? But are Because like you said, DJ Burns, unlike a lot of post players that we're used to that get the ball down low like Zach Eady as close to the rim as they possibly can to get that good position, DJ will take the ball like close to the three-point line and then back his man down. Well, good luck back in Zach down one. And I'm sure DJ Burns can move him a little bit, but it's not as easy as most of the guys he's used to. So you suggested that potentially in your breakdown on feed the post that Zach just backs off two or three feet, which I find interesting because like, I think that's part of, cause he's a great passer, right? Mm-hmm. So when you're coming up on him, you know, if, if Zach's backing up and using his wingspan to deny some of those angles, that might throw off kind of what DJ Burns' bread and butter can be at times, right? Yeah, and and Burns is just so good at using leverage, which is why I kind of threw out the idea, and there's two reasons, I guess, for it, of Edie giving Burns space really outside of 8 to 10 feet is kind of in my head how it, it could work. Um, and then once Burns is like down low on the actual block, then yes, Edie's going to try to body him up and, and all that. 
But Burns is just so good at he creates the contact and then uses that to his advantage. He's going to throw his body into somebody, as all post players do, and then use that to just get to the spot he wants. So now if Edie's backed off, it's like and Burns can knock down a mid-range shot. He absolutely can. Excuse me. But that's, you know, that is Purdue's going to live with that shot over Burns either passing or getting to the rim. And so, yes. And then also on top of that is this is where Edie being 7-4 with a 7-10, 7-10 wingspan can really come in is he can give up a few feet of space, but it's not the end of the world, right? If it, if it, if it was TKR, for example, like TKR would have a much harder time doing that because he's 6-9. But Edie at 7-4, super long wingspan, like you said, he can absolutely get into some of these angles, get into some of the the passing vision for Burns. And that's where if Purdue stays one-on-one, which I don't think is the worst idea, um, you kind of just, you basically make Burns have to beat Edie one-on-one. Is Burns going to get his a few times? Absolutely. But also I would would think Edie's going to stop him a few times as well. Sure. Um, Yeah, it'll certainly be interesting to see. So, you know, so... What would you suggest? You know, you're trying to guess on what they'll do, but what would you, if you were coaching, what would you suggest? Would you double the post or would you just stay with the three point shooters and let DJ Burns get what he can get against the national player of the year? Yeah, I I think I'm staying single coverage. Um, I think it's, and NC State isn't like an insanely good three point shooting team, but they have dudes that can knock them down a couple of them. They, I mean, DJ Horn, we'll talk about later. Like, he is a high level scoring guard. I don't think you want to get him going. Um, it's kind of the conundrum that teams, when they play for Duke, face is like, do you sell out on Edie and dare others to beat you? Or do you basically say, Edie, go score 40, and, and then we'll try to figure it out the rest of the way? Um, I think, especially specifically with Edie and also just, that Burns is only going to play, you know, 25, maybe 30 minutes compared to Edie's close to 40, probably. Um, I expect Edie to be able to outlast Burns in that aspect too, of being able to stay one-on-one bang in the post consistently. Um, and then I think you just shut off everything else. It's if Burns is going to get 30, as long as nobody else is really popping off, then you can, you can live with that. Um, I just, I think it's, I think Burns best attribute and best tool to helping NC state win is his passing. Like when he can set up cutters, when he can set up open shooters, um, just by being DJ Burns, uh, I think that's a bigger thing to deal with than Burns going for 25 points. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Just working through some things here as uh, tickets. People are just begging to go to this pregame and I'm just getting a whole bunch of messages right now. Cause as we are sold out of the QR code tickets for our pregame party here coming up on Saturday morning in Arizona. It's just, I, I, I was telling somebody like I was telling this guy that owns this bar's name, Scott, I go, it is going to be all Purdue fans all over this place. Like I know there's, there's going to be some UConn fans that show up. I'm not saying they won't, but it's like the predominant fan base will be Purdue Boilermaker fans. I already know it just from everything I'm reading, seeing, hearing, it's I'm so excited to get down there. Uh, yeah. and I know everybody else is saw the players took the court here today, um, and had their, you know, opportunity to take their first little practice on the, uh, on the, on the court. It's going to be a, it's going to be an adjustment. I was trying to effort, uh, spike Albrecht who he's going to get some shit. Cause I see him at, he works out at the same gym. I do. He big time does two days in a row. Cause I wanted to get his perspective on that adjustment on, playing on an elevated basketball court. That's a temporary court put in the middle of a football field. You know, I I think for the bigs, like I think they should be able to get comfortable a little faster, but the, but the, you know, the shooters, that's an adjustment, you know, Uh, especially in that first game. I feel like, you know, I, at the end of the day, you know, it's the same rim, same hoop, same length of court, but that eyesight, that sight line of your backdrop behind the hoop is unlike anything they've seen all season. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's going to be a big adjustment here. And that's a real thing. Like, that is absolutely a real thing. Um, I am I am not – I want to make this very clear. I am not comparing myself to a D1 basketball player, but, like – I will. But you In know. high school, I that's what – I was a shooter. That's what I did. I, I shot threes. Um, I was pretty good at it. That, that was my main attribute. And there was absolutely gyms I hated shooting in, and I just couldn't shoot in. Um, because of just the backdrop and I could not imagine the backdrop being a football stadium, like with just your depth and your depth recession gets thrown so off. Um, 
like they put up, I mean, they put up millions of shots in their lives. So there is that muscle memory, but yeah, it's tough when your brains, when you're looking at the rim and your brain's telling you something different than what your muscle memory is used to. Yep. Let's stick with Burns and Edie. Cause this is, I mean, the bigs, obviously Zach and, and the, you know, NC state, you know, has other bigs, but obviously DJ Burns is going to be the focus. Um, because we had a few questions from the chat, so let's try to stay here before we move on to some of the other players. David Jenkins saying Burns seems to have a low release point and low shot trajectory. Uh, Zach will alter those shots. Do you agree with that? Yeah, and I think when I don't know if I ever said this, so if I did, you can stop me. But like, I think the key if Ed plays one on one is just he, and that's why I also think he'll kind of sag off a bit. Is he's just going to make Burns go over the top. And like I've said, Burns is so good at pinning guys on his hips, spinning, and then getting angles that way. I assume like the goal for Edie would be, you're going to shoot over me. If you shoot over me, a little eight foot jumper thing, and it goes in. All right, whatever. If you make a couple, then maybe we adjust. But um, just the ability for Edie to keep Burns in front is going to be huge and make him go over the top because, hey, Zach Edie is... A little bit, a little bit taller. I was going to say bigger, a little bit taller than Burns. Well, and it, so the left hook is not what you're used to, right? As a defender. Yeah. So that's a little unique and something Edie will have to adjust to because you're just used to everybody going to the right hook, you know? So it, it, somebody predominant using that, that's their, that's their go-to is the left hook. That'll be an initial adjustment. Uh, did you see DJ Burns talking about how, you know, uh, talking a little smack almost, uh, did this. you see the, you didn't see the clip? No. Uh, you know, somebody in the chat's going to have to help me out on his exact wording, but he was asked about Zach and he was like, well, he's never seen anybody like me. And it was like, okay, keep talking. Keep talking. That's good. DJ. I love DJ keep, Burns. Uh, yeah, no, he's got a big personality. Somebody might have the, if somebody has the exact quote, he said, I'll, um, um, David Jenkins saying Burns totally poked the bear. If somebody wants to give me the exact quote, I, I saw it on Twitter earlier, but it was essentially to that effect. Uh, we'll, we'll stick with this here a little bit. We got a few more. Um, um, Pray Cash saying Dane Danger is almost the exact same size. I don't know why others keep saying we haven't seen anyone like him. Skill, yes, DJ is very different. I mean, so I, I that's where I would say just having watched DJ Burns here over the last month, you know, he, he captivated me when they won the conference championship, as he did most people. And Dane Danger, I don't know, is at the same level of DJ Burns as far as ability. I don't even know. I would argue he packs a bigger punch as far as size. I mean, they might be the same height and weight, but I don't know. It's it feels like it's carried a little different with DJ Burns. He he's a he's a tank, and I I don't know if I define Dane Danger necessarily as a tank. Yeah, I'm with you there. I'm trying to pull up Danger's exact measurements. And I don't have my glass on. So I don't even know if it matters, to be honest with you, because like I, it's just an Burns eyeball. Just big, like he, yeah, like he, and I, I don't mean that like he's just big, like <laughs> he, he's like, just big. He's just tall. Yeah, no, like he's uh, he's just a he is a big dude, um, and it is incredible that he moves how he does at that size. That's why, I like, and he would, I know you you cover NFL, but like he would be stupid to go to the NFL, but like that's why he's like. NFL scouts are like at least the tiniest bit intrigued with him. Is so dude, Dane, Dane dude, Danger is six nine like two seventy. Yeah, and then DJ Burns is what? I mean, six nine two seventy five. I think is what he's listed at. Okay, it it, it feels like it's two totally different two seventies. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I mean, it it just does. I don't know how to explain that, but um, that's fair. I mean, it, it's somewhat fair. I'm not going to completely dismiss it. Um, and maybe it's just because. The, the people DJ Burns is going up against. He looks so much different. It'll be interesting to see how he looks and how dominant he is when he goes up against Zach Eady. But the same can be said the other way around too. It's going to be interesting to see if Zach can still get his post position and can still, you know, maneuver and get the kind of rebounds he's looking for, you know, going up against DJ Burns. I, like, I don't think any of us as Purdue fans are selling it short. This is going to be an interesting matchup. And and Purdue should win this game, but at the end of the day, these are he's definitely first and foremost the guy we got to be we got to be ready for. Yeah, for sure. But it isn't it isn't just him too for NC State. Um, DJ Horn, their guard, he's he's won them a couple games because Burns has had a couple like that Marquette game. Burns was bad, 
straight up. Um, Horn was a dude that came in. Diara, their four man, I think he's going to be pretty important defensively for them. Um, so as much as it is Burns versus Edie, and that absolutely should be highlighted, it is it is not it is not just Burns versus Edie. You know, Brayden versus DJ Horn might be, I don't want to say a more important matchup, but it's about to be pretty close. Um, and maybe we can flow to it. And, and yeah. I'll bring up, well, actually, before we do that, because I'll stay somewhat on topic, David Jenkins threw up the quote. Um, he said, he, this is quoting DJ Burns, I assume, said he hasn't had anybody who put scoring pressure on him as much as I will. Well, maybe he did, but not on a stage like this. And I, huh. that second part, I guess, is true. Like, yeah, well, nobody's, they've <laughs> neither have been to the final four. So that, that part's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, It'll be interesting, but I, I like that he's saying that he says, Kate, hey, keep talking, DJ. Keep everybody keep talking. I hope they say all sorts of stuff leading up to the game. That's that's good. We need that. That's oh, for uh, sure. <laughs> you know, so, and moving on to kind of the next part, it, for another comment from David Jenkins said, uh, I shared some clips showing Burns struggling to stay with the guard on a high pick and roll. Do they typically defend like that? Seems like Brayden should feast on that. Um, sorry, my puppy just came up to me. Um, yeah. So yeah, the pick and roll burns like. Do I have my clipboard? Is it? Uh oh, let's get the X's and O's out. Here it will we make go. it through security, right? Yeah, of course it will. We will force it through security. If it's not, hard. then it'll be a funny clip on uh, Twitter. <laughs> Joe Jackson gets arrested for his dry erase board. There we go. Cannot wait. A Emmy award winning segment X's and O's with Joe. Action Jackson. So, okay. Do you hear me if I'm like this? Yep. Cool. Oh, man. Sorry for the, the poor lighting and all that. In a different spot. We're going to make things work. There we go. So, and sorry that this is just blurry. There's nothing I can do. Um, Really quick, though. I know it's a little blurry, but DJ Burns is this guy, right? He's guarding Edie, setting the screen. When we think of ED defensively or whatever, we think right drop coverage where he's just going to drop back and kind of really make sure that the ball handler and the roller stay in front. Burns, oftentimes, he just stays with the roller. And so as it comes off the screen, say ED rolls, Burns just kind of stays here. And it's usually, this is Diara. This is their, I think, number 21. Number 23. Number 23, Diara. He's usually going to be guarding like Gillis or TKR. He's the one that actually protects the rib. And so on this pick and roll, He's maybe going to be helping off of Gillis here. And so this should leave this area open for Brayden because um, Burns is going to stay with Edie. And Smith is so good that, yes, maybe he'll find Edie on a couple rolls. But oftentimes this area is going to be open. And then it might be Gillis too. And, and I think Gillis is going to be super important in this game um, because if Diara is coming down, that means Brayden should have a shot or Gillis should have a shot is kind of the thinking. Now, maybe they adjust from that and they want to take away the guards and then the Edie can be hit on the roll a bit more. but. Um, that kind of like, it's just, it's just was different. And sometimes it's not all the time. I don't want to say that's every single possession, but there was a decent bit when I was watching. It was like, Oh, Burns just stays at top. Like he doesn't really, it's almost as if he's not involved in the action. Um, and because of as good as he is foot speed and, and kind of footwork around the rim, he lacks it in on the perimeter and kind of being able to move like that. And then he doesn't have size like Edie where you can, you know, Edie and Edie moves much better now, but Edie can counter that because he's seven, four. And so he can just kind of eat up space. Um, so yeah, I think it should be like Braden. And, and, and it, I just keep, for whatever reason, I just keep going back to Gillis. I just keep going back to like this, this needs to be a Gillis game. Um, it's either Gillis like is going to have a bunch of open threes or if they sell out on kind of the shooters, then that means Braden and Edie and pick and roll should be there every single time, whether it be a Braden pull up or an Edie roll. Um, it, it's should like, there, there should be opportunities for there as long as Purdue just kind of does their thing. That is five dollars. We did, we needed an actual tracker. Yeah. We would have made, I, I would have been know, rich. You know what? Try to be polite and mute myself during the Emmy Award winning segment, and this is what I get for it. Another fine. So, the other thing that stood out to me in your preview, not to completely spoil your preview, watch the preview. It's really good. It puts a visual to the words that are being said here on tonight's show, which really helps you and a caveman like me and an understanding of how this is actually going to break down. But the other thing that really stuck out to me was you said they don't hedge or DJ Burns at least doesn't hedge that often. No. Well, 
just from watching this over and over and over here in the Big Ten this year, if you're not hedging Purdue, like that, that's one of the main things that slows Purdue's offense down and them trying to get into their set and try to either get into the post or running whatever they're running. If you're not hedging this team, I think that presents a serious problem for NC State. It, yeah, it, it basically, if you aren't hedging, you're just conceding like Braden's going to have a mid range shot. It's at minimum, and maybe Braden can create stuff for others. Um, it is, yeah. The hedge is just something that you kind of, and, and Brain's also been so good at it this against it this year is the crazy thing. But like, yeah, that's the one thing where it can take Purdue out for sure. Um, now this this with the kind of drop coverage, if you don't hedge, it does mean Brain has to play well, which I fully trust he will. It, it puts the pressure on him instead of everybody else. Of he has to be able to make a play. He's going to have space to operate. He's going to have looks both for himself and different passing angles for shooters, for Edie on the roll, um, even like some strong side TKR post ups. It's all going to be there, and and it'll if they're going to play that kind of. It's a conservative defense. Purdue plays it too. Um, that means that Braden has to be good. Like just matter of fact, he has to be good. Yep. Yeah, Matt's Matt. version has it. If you don't hedge, you better hope Braden can't hit shots and. That's it. And maybe that's kind of the belief. Is, but even you know if what? he's not hit, like to me, yeah, of course, the mid range and the pull up when you don't hedge, but it also gets Braden going downhill too. Yes. A lot faster. Like he can get downhill even if you hedge him. He'll get around it eventually, but it, it slows everything up just a tick. But if you're not hedging, then he's getting downhill. And it, it to me, opens up the opportunity for drive and kick as well. Yeah, no, 100%. And and how many times, even against Tennessee, did we see where it's like, Brain doesn't even run, and he just kind of waltzes his way, and he's like, oh, here's yep. a layup, because everybody's so focused on everything well, exactly. Else. He's manipulating the guy that's shading Edie, yeah. and he's slowing it. He's, he understands the pace, and so then the guy doesn't fully commit to Braden, yep. but he's not completely stuck on Zach. He's trying to play that tweener role. Well, he knows he's not going to unattach from Zach. And then just softly lay that and, baby in. And then he's, man, I could talk for hours about Braden. Like, there was the one pass specifically, first half Tennessee game. I don't quite remember how much time was left um, in my head for whatever reason. It's like six minutes. I don't know if that's true or not. But for sure, first half Tennessee, he comes off a pick and roll. And it's basically the weak side. It's Jones, one defender, and then also Edie. And at this point, Jones had airballed twice. Smith just looks off the defender. Like he like basically a quarterback and just like looks off the defender, makes him run out to Jones. And what does that leave? Literally a nobody was within 10 feet of Edie at the rim. So he just does that. No look, little drop off to Edie. Um, now it's a dunk. Like if you give brain Smith space to operate, he's going to operate. Just Matt. It's just what he is. He's, yep. he is so good. Yep. Okay. So you want to kick it back around to NC state? I mean, we can come back to some Purdue players that we think are key in this game if we'd like, but I mean, we as Purdue fans, I think understand what each player is capable of down the line for Purdue and, and yep. the players that, you know, the, the main figures in this whole cog, but let's try to get to know some of NC state. So I don't think we've touched enough on DJ horn here. He's yeah. their second best player. He's obviously he's you could argue he's their best player as far as, uh, scoring output and minutes per game, you know, uh, essentially leading the team in minutes per game and points per game at uh, plays around 32 and a half minutes per game and averages almost 17 points per game. So uh, shooting 43% from the field uh, and 40% from three point land. So this is a guy that is public enemy number one on the perimeter. This is who Lance Jones will guard. Um, he Lance Jones will take him. Horn is the like I I'm you guys know I, I keep it honest like Horn is pretty similar to what like you would design to try to beat Purdue in 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 a guard a dude that can get to his jumper he can get to the mid range he can get to a floater he isn't good around the rim so when Edie's there he's probably just not going to take him and there's going to be I'm I'm confident there's going to be that moment where he drills like four of six mid range shots and we're like what's going on. Um, he's that type of player. I mean, he's just going to get the ball, get to the spot, rise up, knock him down. Is there a player in the Big Ten that you'd give him any kind of comparison to? Um, the media one was a little bit bigger, Tyson Walker, and just the style that they play of being kind of shifty, being able to get to one, two dribble pull ups. Um, maybe a be maybe a better shooter. 
Yeah, probably a little bit better. Um, he also Walker's a little bit more on ball, whereas Horn benefits from having a, a good center in Burns um, and can work on some kickouts and things like that. Like Jones, if Jones can stay attached and just make life tough, I've said that for I think every game at this point though. Um, if Jones can stay attached, then that's when you at least make life tough. And if if Horn is going to hit, you know, six just tough mid range jumpers, it's one of those you just kind of live with. Um, He'll get on transition too. Like they don't force an insane amount of turnovers, but they will push the ball if they want to. Horn kind of leads that. Um, and then on they they want to drive. They're not a team that's going to put up a bunch of threes. Horn is a dude that will shoot a bunch of threes, but even him at times, he's he's very willing to catch and go. Um, one, two, three dribbles, floater, 15 footer. Um, he he's a handful and can go. He's a guy that can go for 30. I think he's gone for 30 in this tournament. I'll pull up his exact stats right here. But um, as this loads. Went for oh, yeah. 29, went for 29 in the ACC championship game against uh, UNC has scored double figures in every um, tournament game so far. Yeah. And he had 20 points when they beat Duke. Yep. Um, 20 points and three assists on the game. DJ Burns had 29 points dominating Duke. And then after that, nobody else scored in double figures. And they only had, they only, they only got seven guys on the scoring output. You know, um, yeah, they're not a deep team. They're going to play seven guys. If Edie gets people in foul trouble, they maybe bring in an eighth dude, but it's seven dudes on their rotation. I mean, that and even the seven, you know, I'm looking at a couple of these guys that don't look like really big time scoring contributors. Yeah. So they're getting the majority of their output from three, maybe four players. That's another thing that could be very problematic for this team. You know, for and Purdue, for NC State, for NC State. I mean, I mean, we we talk about Purdue winning the war of attrition so many times this season, they and I'm look, that. and I'm looking at these guys. I mean, just the depth, even beyond the big man depth that Purdue has, that always seems to win out. When you just look at the overall depth of this team, that's that's something that could present real problems for NC State. Yeah, and they're gonna play their guards a lot. Um, Casey Marcel is a dude that he'll start. He isn't really a good shooter, but he's another guy. I assume I assume Fletcher takes him. Um, he's a guy that wants to kind of get to that mid-range shot again, and they have a bunch of dudes that are willing to take it. Um, Marcel, Marcel, yeah, Marcel's very good at driving, but Edie being down there should be able to help that out a lot. He's just whatever as a shooter, um, and you kind of li- you you live with his shots until he makes them, and then from there you adjust. Um, and then their other their other main guard is. Um, what's his name? O'Connell, right? Yeah. Michael O'Connell. He's their point guard. He's definitely a pass first type guy. And if they run pick and roll, he's probably running it more often than not, but he's looking to create for others. He is not um, really, I mean, he can knock down threes. Yeah. He can get, he can get, he can get hot. Yeah. Like he can definitely score the ball. He's just, when you look at how he's used, it is a pass first type of guy. He really is. Um, I do like that. Like similar to Purdue for Purdue's sake, like, their three guards are smaller, kind of like Purdue's. Um, probably they're probably they're a little bit more athletic between Horn and Burn or Horn and uh, Marcel, but it's not like, in, you know, it's not like over um, athletic compared to some of the teams Purdue has played this year, where it's like, oh, how are they going to match up? It's they have they have match up similar in size, um, and they're as you say, it's more athletic, but it's not like a crazy, crazy amount is what I was trying to get to there. All right. So let's talk about then who you have matching up. So yeah, you got, you got Lance Jones. Let's talk about defensively. You got Lance Jones on DJ horn. Yes. Right. You got Zach Eady on DJ burns. Yeah. That's who I would guess. There's no chance of TKR first. Like you don't see that. That, It could happen. My could happen, but And, and that's not what you would do. Yeah. I'm yeah. TKR, TKR, like, I would give it a 25% chance like in my head. Um, so it definitely can happen, but I think Edie does ultimately. Okay. So let's keep going around the horn then. Um, Marcel, who do you got on Marcel? Fletch, I assume is going to take him um, just because Marcel's kind of that third guard. How tall is he? Six, three. Okay. Yeah. He'll be more physical than Fletch, but he's a dude like he's out of their starting five. He's probably their fourth scoring option. Yep. Um, and, then, and then you got Braden Smith on, on O'Connell. Yep. And that's kind of the point guard matchup. And then the last one is TKR on Diara. Who's there. Diara is a dude we need to talk about. Um, 
that maybe we can just do that right here. But TKR. Yeah, but before before we get into TKR, I want to give a shout out to Todd Schaefer, nineteen ninety nine super chat. Safe trip to Arizona. Let's bring back a trophy. Boiler yep. up. That's the goal, Todd. We'll do our best. If, Appreciate. Uh, if Purdue, well, it, uh, you can finish your comment, but if Purdue wins, guys, I'm putting it at like. I'm putting it at like a 50% chance that Braggs at some point ho- holds and or takes a photo with the with the trophy. <laughs> like I'm not kidding about that either. <laughs> I did take a picture with the Big Ten trophy last year. I have no shame. Um, all right. Well, before we try to get <laughs> try to get to third here on this show, we could honestly go the excitement for this game. Oh. I, I've I've done four Bears shows here this week on CHGO Bears. Couldn't care less. Like I could, I don't know if I could have cared less about. And I, hey, all due respect, I, I'm excited for the Caleb Williams era here in a few weeks, but like, my God, get me to Saturday. We could literally do this preview show for three hours for all I care. But uh, let's give a shout out to Autograph here real fast before we do and uh, get into the next part portion of our show here for our final four preview show, NC State versus Purdue. So yeah, Autograph, the, the app that we've been talking about for a month or two at this point now. Um, great app that you can get all your Purdue content in one specific spot. So you just log in completely free, use code bits. If you're signing up for the first time, B I T S. Um, and then you can just, you get all your Purdue content in one specific spot. So whether it be our podcast or boiler upload or black and gold's articles or stuff like that, that you kind of would just consume anyways. Now it's in one spot and you can be rewarded. And so the more you interact with articles and podcasts and comments and others, there's a leaderboard and then you get rewards. And then those rewards you can use to enter like free raffles for, I think there's like some signed basketballs and stuff like that. They also had an, like just an insane amount of ticket deals throughout these last few months of the college basketball season, Uh, multiple Purdue games, multiple big 10 tournament games and other conferences, multiple games throughout the, the March madness run. Um, Did they have, do they have something for the final four? Uh, I think they might have. I think they might have already sent people to it. Yeah, they, I think they're sending people to the final four, and like those those tickets are that you would win are sixteen bucks a piece. Um, for anybody that's that's looked at tickets, sixteen dollars for a final four ticket isn't that bad of a deal? <laughs> Not um, bad. Uh, so yeah, we we you the QR code is here. They are on Apple and Android. Scan it, sign up completely free. Use code bits, and then get rewarded for being a Purdue fan as they go and hopefully uh, bring back a trophy. Yeah, it's a great database um, for you to, you know, get all your content in one spot. And, and we're in there, and Boiler Upload is in there, Black and Gold is in there, uh, Field of 68, you name it, all the way down the line. Uh, they're doing a great job of kind of putting everything in one place for you to get all the Purdue Boilermaker content you absolutely can find, and, and all the other uh, college uh, teams in sports you're looking for. So shout out to autograph for being a great partner. Once again, use this promo code you see here on the screen and use the, or this QR code and then use the promo code bits B I T S to sign up. It's completely free. Shout out to autograph, uh, for their help here. So, all right. Um, we got another super chat here coming in from your huckleberry. I like it. I'm your huckleberry here Four ninety nine super chat. Boiler up, boys. Love the breakdown and coverage. Let's go. Let's go. We're all very excited. Thank you for your support here. Um, so, yeah, let's let's try to – you said you wanted to go into TKR zone here, huh? Yeah, TKR versus Diara, also Gillis. Um, so, uh, Muhammad Diara, number 23 for NC State. He's probably the more – and this is coming from somebody that hasn't watched a ton of NC state. And it's just, you know, listening to, to the, the media at this point about them, he seems like he's probably one of the more overlooked players. Like I, he's probably the third most important player on this team. What he does defensively can kind of tie up anything that Burns can't do. You're going to see him be the one protecting the rim a ton. He moves really well so he can guard out on the perimeter if needed. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if, I wouldn't be shocked if Purdue goes to TKR, assuming DR is guarding TKR. Excuse me. I'm uh I'm a little bit a little bit of a cold since Detroit. I'm trying, I'm trying to get Uh-oh. through it. I know. Uh oh. I've been I've been uh responsibly pounding Dayquil and fluids and all that. <laughs> See, I'm if you had to get just been it. drinking whiskey like I appear tried to peer pressure you into maybe that would have your me. immune system would be a little higher right now, Joe. That problem, maybe. So feel pretty good. But um 
I wouldn't be shocked if Purdue goes to TKR against DR into the post early just to try to get DR in foul trouble. I think he's that important to what they do defensively. Um, he can be versatile. I don't expect him to match up with Edie. I don't think that would be smart if NC State does just for that foul, that foul reason. Um, but and then I mean offensively, it's, he's he's gonna finish around the rim. He's 32% from three on the season on you know two it's uh, one and a half attempts a game. So it's like he could take them. Um, but he's not like a huge offensive force. He is just a very, very, very good uh, rim protector. He's also one of the better rebounders in the country. He's the best rebounder on this team. This is an NC State team that they're what? They're about at, they're a little below average country uh, nationwide in, in terms of rebounding percentage. Like I think, I think if DR gets in foul trouble, then NC State's in, they're in a lot of trouble is kind of how I view him. Just what he does defensively is, is I cannot overstate it. Yeah. Steric Mulliken here in the chat saying, Joe, I had no idea you were under the weather. I see your intensity tonight, engaged, locked in. This is high quality Joe talk. And I love it's it. Flu game. It's his flu game. It's his flu game. Uh, you'll be just fine. Once you yeah. get on that plane, uh, you're going to, you're going to be all good tomorrow. I promise you. So oh, yeah. Um, all right. So yeah, TKR certainly a big key here in this game. You know, they, they, they feature two guys, you know, two bigs of sorts. Cause how, how tall is Diara? Six ten. Six ten. So, and they're starting both these guys. Yep. So that's, that lines up with what Purdue is trying to do as far as matchup wise, typically TKR, you're always kind of in this moment of, you know, takes give and take on one end versus the other where, you know, most teams don't play two bigs, at least of that size. And so um, it seems like both these teams kind of match up pretty evenly. So if I flipped it to the other end on where we went down the line of who Purdue would guard defensively. So then who are you saying they would guard defensively? So out of their start, is there any is there any differences from what we already went through? Um. Ooh, like would, see, would like see, would they could, put Diara on Edie and leave Burns off of him? I, I think the only way they do that with Diara is if they're doubling the post because like. And maybe they just trust him that much, but like I really think they cannot afford to get DR in foul trouble. Um, and maybe I'll be proven wrong, but like I would expect DR to take TKR, e Burns to take ED, um, O'Connell will take Smith. The only two that might be flipped, I could see Horn, Horn taking Lawyer and Morcel taking Jones. Um, and that'd be the flip compared to what Purdue did, you know, because yeah, Jones might attack the rim a little more. Yeah. Although and, Lawyer has been attacking the rim quite a bit here. I think it's the physicality too. Horn is a little bit smaller. Um, he's closer to a Fletcher lawyer type build, uh, more athletic, but just pure like size and, and uh, strength or whatever. Um, so I could see that happening, just trying to also keep him out of foul trouble. But like you said, lawyer's been attacking the rim. The other thing that's interesting is like, and it's been the fun thing with Purdue all year is TKR is going to sub out about five minutes into the game and in comes Mason Gillis. And that's where I think it can get really, really interesting is that's where like, I assume Diara has to take Gillis on the perimeter because if Burns is out there, then like if Burns is out there, um, it's on Gillis. I mean, then it's Purdue just has to score basically every bucket. They really do. Um, they NC state wouldn't, should not be able to keep up if Burns is out on the perimeter guarding Gillis. And so assuming Diara is on Gillis, that's where I think like, let's go back to the board. Let's, so, Let's go two boards in one night. And it's going to be a pretty similar concept to what I just talked about. Okay. Damn it. I love this board. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as I get situated again, I know for audio, I'm sorry. Um, which we are on Apple, Google, and Spotify podcasts. If you guys do ever need to just listen to this audio, I know there's plane rides coming up, stuff like that. So go check us out there. Five-star review. We would appreciate that. So it's the same concept, right? This pick and roll and say, let's say even Burns is kind of just in drop coverage. Diara is the one that I've said how many times now? I'm sorry about this reflection, but Diara is the one that I've said, he's the one that protects the rim. But what Purdue loves doing is they have Gillis replace out here. And so sometimes he'll set, it's sometimes it's called Spain pick and roll where he sets a back screen on Burns here and then flips out. Sometimes he just replaces the role. And so he's going to go out here. 
And so, or I guess in this case, he would actually, he would actually come out this way, but that's me nitpicking. But then it becomes, okay, what is, what is DR going to do against Gills? Is he going to follow him out to the perimeter? And so now you're going to, you know, have one of these smaller guards have to help at the rim, especially when Burns is in, who maybe he'll get back in time. Um, if DR stays with him, then it's, Edie's just going to, if DR follows Gillis, Edie's going to get right here and just seal and just go to work. Um, or does DR stay here? And that's where Gillis needs to come out and he's got to knock down threes. And so I, I hope that that made some sense, but I really do think like whenever I think about this game, which has been a lot over the past however many days, I just always come back to like, I think Gillis can be the guy that breaks this game wide open for Purdue. Love it. Love it. And you know, um, he does such a good job of getting himself involved in other ways, but got to, got to, got to grip it and rip it. You know, if you watched the highlight film that Purdue put together, Purdue creative, Andrew Bay does an unbelievable job with the hype videos almost, or the oh, recap yeah. videos. And they did their final four video. It's available on YouTube, um, on their, on their main social. Boiler yeah. Boiler ball, main social. Uh, they go to the halftime locker room. And Painter says, you know, I know these shots are going to fall, you know? And then at one point he goes, and if they don't, we got to make sure we're process based. But then the other thing he said too, was when you have your opportunity, you got to take that shot. You got to be, you got to be shot ready. And so in this regard, like that's got to be the message for Mason Gillis in, in the scenarios you're drawing up where he's going to get a lot of opportunities He's got to be shot ready. And I'm not saying he's been overly hesitant here in the tournament, but even in the last game, like I think everybody understood Zach Eady is dominating. Yes, I can take a three here, but, or I can get it into Zach and he's going to be the high percentage. He's going to get his bucket and probably a foul to 40 and 12 or what he, uh, whatever he ended up with 16, 40, yeah. 40 and 16. Thank you. So the, the game plan worked but it could have been broken open had those threes knocked down and then maybe they wouldn't have had to felt like they needed to play it conservative and continue giving it to the guy with the highest efficiency in the country around the rim. So for that, that being said, Mason Gillis got to be shot ready here. Uh, you're going to have your opportunities. Camden Heidi too, right? I mean, yep. he's going to fall into this same, Even same much to a degree. Yeah. Shot ready, man. Um, so Cause th that's the other aspect. Like if, if, if Purdue wanted to get out and run on these guys, I'm not saying they would because they wanted to slow it down against Tennessee. So is there any thought from you that they might want to, because like DJ Burns doesn't only plays like what? 20, 22 minutes a game. Yeah. 2025. 20, oh, and I, I think we can all just tell from his <laughs> girth, like he's not necessarily going to be running up and down the court. So is there any thought to, Purdue picking up the tempo as opposed to trying to slow it down against Tennessee because Purdue's one of the best half court teams in the country. So that's their bread and butter, but could they potentially try to run NC state out of the gym? Um, I think there's definitely a degree. Um, and I think they would have probably liked to have run a little bit more against Tennessee. It's just Tennessee is so physical. It makes it tough. Um, no, I think it's specifically when Burns is in and we haven't talked about his backup middle Brooks at all. Um, and he's middle Brooks is a little bit more mobile, not a little bit. He is, he is more mobile just straight up. Um, not, a, not a really a, a huge offensive threat, but when Burns is in, like you can have that and Edie, Edie's not going to beat everyone down the floor, but Edie can move like Edie can run and he can rim run, um, or you yep. can set those drag ball screens kind of where, what I mean by that is like as brain and Edie are running up the floor together, Edie's going to come up and immediately just set a screen and go from there. Um, so I could see that for sure. And that's got to start with misses though. Is kind of what painter has said is I mean, I think, I think he said in, in, I thought it was a Tennessee game, maybe the Gonzaga game where it was just like, we're getting stops. We're just not being able to reward ourselves and run. And so he's like, it starts with that of if you can get stops, um, especially if say, if it is burns taking kind of a little post hook shot, you're kind of in position to run where Edie can grab it. I'll let it to brain really quick and then go. Um, so when Burns is in, there's definitely going to be opportunities and spots for, for Braden to push Lance to push. We know Lance will be ready, um, and just be able to get downhill. Lawyer will, lawyer will push the ball. I don't know how it always works out or if it'll always work out, but he will push the ball. Yeah. I mean, well, it worked out when they were down 11 and he had two big layups in that run, mm -hmm. him and Zach Eady 
bringing them back here to take the lead to start, you know, to to get to the halftime tunnel against Tennessee. So uh, Fletcher Lawyer had one of the more clutch games of anybody on that team here. Um, big game Fletch continues to show up when it counts. So shout out to him and his defense has really been picking it up here lately. He had that strip, you yeah, know, um, and then, that. yep, yep. And he chased that one down where he got the foul as the guy was climbing up his back. So, you know, uh, really inserting himself into the game in a positive way. So uh, where, where else do you want to take this? You know, we're getting close to the hour mark. Is there any anything specific you want to hit on or any player specific you want to check in on before we call it a night? Um, I feel like I've, I've hit on oh, the only guy I guess from them. I haven't hit on is Jaden Taylor. He's their backup guard. Um, and like I said, they have seven man rotation. They have a backup big in Middlebrooks who I've kind of already talked about. He's just, he can move pretty well defensively. Um, he'll be kind of hedging a little bit more up at the level against screens offensively. He's going to be mainly around the rim. Um, and, and even at that, he hasn't been great. So the other guy is Jaden Taylor. He's like a six foot four guard. Um, pretty solid build. At times, with how the rotation works, and I highly doubt they go to it against Purdue unless bad things happen. Um, but he will play the four for them some, and he is he's six four one ninety. Um, and so if that happens, then Purdue has to dominate the glass, and they have to dominate the interior. Uh, he'll knock down a, a spot up three. He can he's done that pretty well. He can get out in transition. He'll get out in transition, kind of push the ball, get those good uh, stuff at the rim. He's probably one of their better perimeter defenders. So. That's kind of all I have on him. Is there, we didn't talk about Heidi or Colvin, I guess is kind of the two, but like they're going to do their role. Um, Heidi will have come in. He's probably going to take horn when he's in for Jones after that first stint, have to defend well, knock down an open three. If NC state does decide to double eating the post, then he has to be ready to attack closeouts, catch the ball, rip, go to the rim. Um, and, and good things should happen. Same thing, kind of similar thing with Colvin. I don't know if, I don't think he'll guard horn necessarily, but uh, just do his job defensively, come in, maybe knock down a three, get to the rim a little bit, call life good, and hopefully move on to a championship game. Yeah, for sure. Um, so looks like we might be opening a second bar. <laughs> I'm oh. in I'm in conversation with Scott, who owns three bars right near the stadium, and I think there's a potential that we may open up some of the ticket opportunity to this second bar called Bodega. Uh, but stay tuned for those announcements here. A lot of moving parts. Exciting time to be a Purdue Boilermaker fan. Um, just going to be a lot of fun here in the next day and a half. Uh, we did have some people in the chat asking, um, when do we leave? Joe leaves tomorrow. What morning? Uh, right around noon. Right around noon. And at right around noon, I'll be at Wrigley Field. Uh, we're doing this thing for CHGO Cubs called the Friday 120 Club. So me and Cody Del Mendo of CHGO Cub fame, we're going to be at Murphy's Bleachers in the morning, then in the left field bleachers in the afternoon, and then finishing at Almost Home. Uh, it's going to be a, a fun event. We're doing 14 Friday day baseball games at Wrigley Field. So if you're a Chicagoan or a Cubs fan, you ever want to come hang, that's where I'll be on 14 Friday day baseball games here this upcoming season, the Friday 120 club. So that's why I'm not going to be in Phoenix tomorrow. <clears throat> so I'll be leaving in the morning on Saturday as there's a Cardinal fan in my chat. That's just begging to get booted. No, I'm kidding. You're more than welcome. It's fine. Um, yeah, it's going to be cold here at Wrigley. It's cold in the region it is cold as I am region. also from crown point, Mr. Duncan Kesar. Uh, so <clears throat> I don't know. Um, we got anything else? I mean, that was pretty good there. I know we got, uh, Robbie Hummel and, and Bobby Riddell set to join us tomorrow morning. And, uh, I think right now we're setting the time around 11 AM Eastern 10 PM or 10 AM central 8 AM Pacific time. As I get my time zones down. There you go. Um, yeah, look at me, look at me. So, um, I'm going to be making the link for it because Bobby said to lock it in. So um, schedules are always a little tricky. So if they end up canceling, we won't completely hold them to it, but maybe we will. I've already fired Bobby like three times this season. So, uh, but we tried to get it in on what Wednesday night. Yeah. Uh, but they ended up going to this. They ended up going to the Phoenix suns game, which all right. You want a big, you want a big time us for the Phoenix suns game, Bobby, then maybe we're not going to invite you to our, our Cubs trip that we take 
this year like we took last year. No, he'll be invited. Uh, your Huckleberry saying hit the like button. It helps the channel. You're absolutely right. Uh, anybody that's tuned in here on YouTube, uh, please hit the like button. Subscribe to the channel. If you're watching on Twitter or Facebook, we definitely appreciate your support and your viewership always. Uh, but it does help us if you ever go over to the YouTube channel. Brags in the stands, as you see over my shoulder, is the network itself and the channel name. And then you'll see the whole Boilers in the Stands library that's getting loaded up here these last couple months here with a ton of fun interviews. We had Dakota Mathias on. If you didn't watch that show on Tuesday, definitely go back and check it out. The Midwestern Cowboy making his first appearance here on the show. Uh, so, yeah. Um, like I said, Bobby Buckets and Robbie Hummel tomorrow for the final Final Four preview show uh, coming up, and then we'll see you for the post game, the post game show yep. of the our Final Four post game show. Joe, are you terrified? I like. I'm excited. I'm confident. Like it's funny because like you know how I've been. You've had to like talk me off the ledge before every game. I don't know you, if if it's. Just me, somebody in the chat can tell me, but you were going, your mic was doing something there. What did my mic do? Or maybe it's me. Maybe it's yeah. me. I might be lagging. Yeah, it's you. It might be me. It's you, because now, okay. vi- now, now your video just froze too. Joe's at his mom's house. So anybody asking, like, people were like, Greg, get this dude a uh, um, better lighting. He's at his mom's, okay? He lives in Indy. He had to come up to the region because he's flying out of Chicago tomorrow morning. So he's not in his normal studio, so to speak. So um, we're just doing our thing. I, I I don't know, Joe. Like I've gone through. It's so weird to walk into this game as Joe just leaves me. Oh, this is dangerous, people. We are we are in trouble now. It's just you and me. We are in big trouble if he's gonna leave me by myself. Like big trouble. So I've been. <laughs> don't ever do that to me again. It's been. Four years since I did a boiler show by myself. Three years, at least. Don't ever do that to me again. Um, so what I was going to say was, you know, every one of these games, even the Grambling State game, like nervous as hell going into the game. And every time you're like, Greg, they play their game, they're going to win. You go to the Utah State game, same thing. If they play their game, they're going to win. All the way down the line, Gonzaga, then Tennessee. So now we get to this point, we're playing, you know, We've gone through a gauntlet here. You know, the Mountain West champions, you know, beating Gonzaga and Tennessee after playing them already this year, you know, and and now you're playing an NC State team who Purdue did play a couple years ago and beat them in overtime. It was a miracle win. Um, The only reason I really remember that game is Sasha Stefanovic, our guy, hitting a big time three at the end of that game uh, to help the Boilers win. It was in Brooklyn, New York. If you recall, yep. First um, one is number one ranked team at that point too. In that's history. right. That's right. Uh, because they lost to Rutgers right after that, right? Right before it. Right before it. Okay. So yeah, they lost to but Rutgers, yeah. but they were still ranked number one for the rest of that week and beat NC State at uh the Brooklyn Nets, um, what whatever their stadium's called, the Oracle or something like that. Uh so. Yeah, so I wouldn't say too much familiarity there. It was the same head coach though, right? Uh, I think so. So yes, Kevin Keats. Yeah, because somebody just the only player on that team though was Marcel. Okay, so only player Marcel. That's on this team, same head coach, Sally Ammermans. You know, um, feeling what we're putting down here to finish the show. Talk about the NC State coaching. Can you? I don't. I don't have like a ton. Um, he's what basically, I guess I can do a little bit. They've flipped around. So there's been a couple things that have happened, right? Cause for anybody that doesn't, I assume most people know that watch this, but like, if you don't NC state was NC state was a missed free throw away from not even be sniffing the tournaments. Like they were going to get bounced in like the second round, of the ACC tournament and not even, not even be eligible for like the NIT type stuff. Um, what they did on that, these they're on what a nine game winning streak now is what it is. They have tightened up interior, and so they're forcing more floaters. Um, they're taking away a little bit more at the rim. 
And then they're also just, they're kind of giving up a little bit more than mid range defensively. And that's kind of been a, a defensive uh, flip for them. They're, there's a lot of talk with three point variance, right? And just what it is, three point variance is what it is. They've done a decent job defending the three. They're, what I, I can say is, even the ones that teams have gotten open against them, they've done a good job of at least making them not like fully in rhythm. Um, so there, there is a little bit of that of like they've definitely changed some things defensively offensively it's been pretty much like they're going to go through burns and then if that doesn't work they're going to let horn or uh horn go to work and or o'connell kind of run pick and roll and facilitate but defensively they have switched up a little bit of just tightening up defensively um taking away the rim a bit more and defending the three-point line and hey what do you know those are uh two pretty important things for teams to do throw up a couple super chats here uh from ryan lewis two dollars says dry eraser mark dry erase marker fun for whiteboard joe <laughs> i appreciate that um I bought, I think, like an eight pack at the beginning of the season. So, I'm say um, two dollars only gets you one. We need an eight pack or a ten pack there, Ryan. <clears throat> Not enough. Not enough. Well, it covers one. We appreciate that. And then yes. the other one uh, from James Palmer, five dollars. I've never dunked before, but I bet I can dunk on Joe Jackson. Whoa, whoa. I mean, maybe I'd, uh, I'd be impressed to see it. Um, I, I haven't, I haven't hooped in really since the season started with being so busy, but. I assume I could go out there and grab a rim right now. Like I, I think that's within my my uh, capabilities. I don't think I can dunk right now, but I could grab rim. Well, I know I'd put a mean hook shot on you, Joe. I don't care how tall you are. You I bo- booty ball. You, you get the booty DJ ball. Burns over Edie. We did have that's right. So um, we did have a question in the chat. Edie will be national player of the year. Yes. When is that announced? When is that announced, Joe? Is that after the season? a good question i'll I try forget. to find out yeah i i almost feel like it was announced i think he's already won one or two of them yeah but the but the main one the one where they put the yeah. trophy at Mackey next year um i don't know i was looking at it four dash four slash seven is what i'm seeing which would be sunday so the day between the final four and the championship like why can't they just do this stuff after the game like that's crazy to me yeah, I don't know. But that's what it's seen. But well, hey, Tom White said it, April 12th, so maybe that's Jeff Hart said April 7th. I think April 7th. I'm going to rock it. If, okay, so it's April 7th, and he wins. If they, they win on Saturday, then he wins National Player of the Year on Sunday. Then you're now walking into the game on Monday as the two-time National Player of the Year. Uh, he better get the respect of a two-time National Player of the Year. Thank you very much. Uh, but first things yep. first. We got NC State to worry about. All the people at my office talking about UConn, Purdue, UConn, Purdue. We're focused on Saturday. We are focused on Saturday. We're focused on nothing else but Saturday. And I'm not going to be looped in to some kind of conversation about a game that hasn't occurred. Because, like, it was annoying to me. I'm at CHGO. We've got to schedule our week next week for all our different shows, Bears, and I produce for Cubs, Blackhawks, Bulls, and other stuff. And I'm, like, trying to explain to him, like, he's like, well, you can work thursday wednesday and thursday right and friday and i'm sitting here going well there's hypotheticals where we might be busy on thursday potentially or friday i you know I, but oh, i don't even want to i don't even would have I, right but i don't even want to say why because i don't want to jinx it yeah. i don't want to talk about it but i have to talk about it for my work schedule and it's really annoying so that's what we're up against here um so that's it that's all i got again yep um, um I, I was just I'm gonna just say gonna, sh- Go ahead. I'm. I was just gonna. I was just gonna shout out feed the post again. Um, of course, I've gotten a lot of love on there over the past couple of weeks. You guys have really enjoyed these scouting reports, so um, I appreciate all the the love and support on that feed the post on YouTube. Um, have the Purdue uh, NC State breakdown. If if Purdue were to win and move on to the championship, I would have. Um, I will have the Purdue versus UConn or Purdue versus Bama scouting report up most likely immediately after the conclusion of the Bama UConn game. So uh, also just selfishly for there's a little bit of selfishness. One of my goals this year, and and I understand it's not all numbers, but I'm a numbers dude for anybody that follows. One of my goals was to have 25,000 views on a video. Um, My Purdue NC state one just crossed 20,000. So uh, 5,000 more to go in the next day and a half before it really becomes um, kind of irrelevant. So, uh, but 20k in itself i've had crossed 20k in a couple of videos this past couple of weeks is which is which is insane to think about 
Very good. Very good, man. Proud of you. You're, you're doing a great job and um, you're just going to continue to skyrocket. Craig Bowers saying way to go big red. So Craig Thanks, must Craig. have land. Craig must have landed or he paid for oh, Wi-Fi on his plane. He should have done, paid for Wi-Fi and done the show on the plane. Yeah. <laughs> it just disrupted real. everybody. Everybody. Well, I, you know, it's yeah. probably all Purdue fans. So that's, I know it's a connecting fair. flight from Dallas, but I'm sure it's just all Purdue fans leaving from Dallas. To Every Purdue. flight going to Phoenix is probably just 100% Purdue fans. Well, Craig will be on tomorrow morning. Just touched down. Craig Bowers jumping in. Um, dang. Now he's even calling wow. you out. Are you sick? Dude, this dude. This dude. Uh, yeah, I, I am a little sick. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, well. I'm trying my hardest to get over it. <laughs> so um, Craig's going to be on tomorrow morning with uh, Bobby Buckets Riddell and Robbie Hummel. I will try to make it, but I highly doubt I'll be able to in the midst of the madness at Murphy's bleachers. Um, Craig is suggesting whiskey and honey. That's what I've tried to tell him. Drink a bunch of whiskey. One day he'll listen to us, Craig, but uh, I think for tonight, he'll probably just take NyQuil. Um, Ed Albanese asking hypotheticals that you are only allowed to ask on sunday when we do a preview show on sunday tonight and yep. i'm even putting it on the screen we're not we're not entertaining those hypotheticals we are focused on nc state lock in lock in ed oh man um so again limited tickets available for our pregame party at carousel four minute walk from the stadium uh, they have three different bars we're considering opening. I'm going to just kind of leave it to uh, those guys because we got one bar to handle. That's enough for me. Uh, but it's at the, the carousel bar is at 6770 North Sunrise Boulevard uh, in Glendale, Arizona. So it's a $15 cover. We had a QR code where you could have purchased tickets here in the last day and a half or two days. It's not even, it's a day and a half. And, um, those tickets are completely sold out. So now all we're, all that's left are, he's going, he left enough room for some walk-ups. So there is still walk-ups available to come to carousel Saturday morning, but those are going to go quick as well. This is a bar that's right next to the stadium. It's going to be Purdue fans only. Um, you're going to have a potentially a couple former players that I've reached out to stopping by, and, um, you know, so it, the, the doors open at 9 a.m. So if you can get there, I, I hope everybody that's trying to get there can make it. But it's very, it, you know, capacity is capacity. So uh, we're going to try to make it work for as many people as possible. But come on out to Carousel once again. So shout out to those guys uh, for giving us a home here uh, coming up uh, this weekend. We did get a $5 super chat once again from James Palmer saying I've called for Matt Painter being fired many times in the past year years. Could you tell him I'm sorry and kiss him right on the lips for me? Well, yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> they win a national championship. Uh, he, you know, he going to get a big old smacking. Um, that's, um, we, we appreciate him. So, uh, Jeff parks rooting for Bama. Uh, but we're rooting for Purdue. Uh, Scott White here in the chat saying locked, loaded, and ready. Great pregame show, guys. You're the best. Boiler up. That's the famous Scott White, the owner of the carousel. It's also got you know a couple other bars. One's going to be an Alabama bar. The other one, Bodega here. Um, you know, another bar. So we're working through some things got like 40 hours before these parties tip off. So I'm going to let Scott decide if he wants to try to open up that other bar in the morning to Purdue fans. Uh, I'm down for whatever, but obviously we'll promote whatever you need, Scott. So we appreciate you. Uh, but again, I think that wraps things up for the Midwestern goodbye. Shout out to everybody that signed up to come out to carousel. Uh, thank you to everybody that's tuned in here in the chat. Once again, hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already. Um, and make sure you're heading over to the feed the post here on YouTube and watch Joe's breakdown of this game. Really, nobody does it better in the business. We know this. So Joe will be in Arizona tomorrow. I will be in, uh, well, Scott White. Jeez Louise. Um, I guess that isn't the right Scott. Whatever, Scott. 
We got multiple Scots in our chat, and that's what I love about Scots. Anyway, um, anyway, I you know this kind of stuff just throws me off. This is why live chats always throw me off. Anyway, uh, I I don't got anything else other than I love all of you. I can't wait to see you on Saturday. Craig's gonna take okay. care of you tomorrow. Robbie Hummel, Bobby Buckets. I've said all these things like six times. Is there anything else? Boiler up. <laughs> Boiler up. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Linda Jackson. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Craig Bowers, Bobby Buckets, and Robbie Hummel bringing it home for you this week. Final four, baby. Let's ride.